This is the Mississippi Outdoors Podcast. I'm your host, Matt White. And if you've ever dreamed of, been interested in, or even thought about, what would it be like to take a canoe trip down the Mississippi River, maybe for a day, maybe for a week? We're talking to someone today who not only has done it, but could take you. He is John Rusky on the Mississippi Outdoors Podcast. This episode of the Mississippi Outdoors Podcast is brought to you by the Foundation for Mississippi Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. You're listening to the Mississippi Outdoors Podcast, and I'm your host, Matt Wyatt. Our guest today is described as a worker bee in the colony of his queen, the Mississippi River. He is John Rusky. He can make canoes, and he can help you take a trip in one all the way down the Mississippi River. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here today. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure being here. So uh, that might be a good place to start, that, that idea right there. What does that mean? I, I read that in something online and it was about you uh, a worker bee in the colony of his queen the mississippi river what, what's that mean well it goes back to uh 1998 when i started the canoe company um i had come down the river decades earlier in the in the 80s for the first time colorado born kid and uh and uh followed the rivers further and further downstream and eventually ended up on the big river and um, I thought I'd discovered heaven down here. And um, But one thing about it is that uh, we didn't see anybody else out there uh, like us, uh, paddling or kayaking or um, stand-up paddleboarding on that big river. On the Mississippi River. On the Mississippi. And come from Colorado, you know, that's just a thing people do all over. And the uh, getting outdoors means... Uh, Hiking, uh, backpacking, yeah. skiing, you know, all the uh, uh, kind of human propelled kind of activities are big time out there where I was born and raised. And um, it seemed like uh, the river was, uh, was uh, I don't know, this is being uh, uh, poetic, but it seemed like the river was kind of uh, lonely and, and looking for attention. And I felt like every time I shared a story, because I'm an explorer I, I, or outdoors person. I've been, been that way since I was born. Uh, I just have to get outdoors or I don't, I feel bad. You know, mm -hmm. I can't uh, function as a person. <laughs> and <laughs> um, and uh, I kept realizing over and over again that there was no one else except for a few fishermen and towboats, of course, and a few work boats, you know, like uh, Coast Coast Guard and um, Army Corps boats. But beyond that, out on that big river, the biggest river in North America we're talking about, um, there was no one else in human-powered vessels uh, exploring and enjoying this. Uh, to me, it was like a paradise, a, a paddler's paradise. And so I felt like it was became eventually uh, uh, part of my mission um to uh, to share that number one and then make it possible for others to enjoy that same kind of experience which is so rewarding and you have you've done that in different ways some tangible some being a guy but like for example the quapaw canoe company mm -hmm. take me back to sort of the genesis of that you you started a company where you're building canoes. When did that start? In 1998. So uh, we're in our 26th year this year. Last year was our quarter century uh, anniversary, and we're kind of still celebrating now. Yeah, We do everything a little bit behind the ball, you know, river time, we call it. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> um, back in the 90s, I was a curator at the Delta Blues Museum in Clarksdale. Yeah. And leading a, a very fulfilling life as a, uh, musician and uh and the coolest job really in the universe some people would say uh you know working yeah. at the delta blues museum and uh, shelly ritter she she's from here she she now runs it and um but uh being the outdoors guy that i am uh, i started getting claustrophobic even in the best uh, indoor job that you know i can mm -hmm. dream of and um so i started exploring the the, the river near clarksdale um, from Quapaw Landing and Montezuma Landing and Hill House Landing. Those are the three landings that are close to us. Hill House is on DeSoto Lake. Okay. And um, 
And uh, as the years went on uh, in the 90s, um, I came to the realization that um, there are a lot of people, uh, I would see them at the Delta Blues Museum, they'd want to get out on the river. And we're talking about West Europeans and and uh, Japanese and Aus- Aussies and Kiwis and you know people from all over the world to come to Clarksdale on uh, some of them once a lifetime journey and um, and from all over the United States, West Coast, East Coast, you know, the middle of America. And and they had the desire to somehow get on the Mississippi River. They want to see the Mississippi. It's you know it's on their bucket list actually. You know the Grand Canyon, Statue of Liberty. Uh, the Delta Blues Museum and the Mississippi River, and um, and so time and time again, uh, how do I get out to the river? And we, you know, we could send them out to a landing or yeah. over in Helena. There's an overlook, and Memphis has a little overlook. And uh, but um, you know, a lot of people come and they want to experience. There's like 24 million paddlers in North America, Canada, and, and the U.S. And uh, they want to get their hands on. They want to feel it, you know. They want to get wet. And the Germans yeah. want to jump in the water, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, so I realized it took a long time for me to come to realization, but uh, I realized I could uh, – maybe there was a need there. And mm-hmm. um, so I started taking people out one at a time in the late 90s, like 97 and 98, uh, one at a time in a uh, uh, a two-person Grumman canoe which was my first canoe ever, and um, and it, that's where it took off. It, it, it worked. People mm-hmm. wanted to go out. And um, in 1998, uh, my uh, um, childhood school contacted me and wanted to send a whole group of kids in 99. So I was like, uh, well, I can uh, put 10 uh, uh, two person canoes, or I think it would have taken 12 actually for this group is pretty yeah. like over 20 people. Uh, and, um, or, uh, I could build a big canoe. I learned about this big canoe tradition, which comes from the great lakes area. Uh, call, uh, they're called Voyager canoes and they go back hundreds of years back to the, uh, uh French fur trapper, uh, era of the great mm-hmm. lakes. And I I, re, I learned that I, that there were these big canoes that you could put like ten or even twenty people in one canoe, and safely paddle them with wow. one person who knows how to paddle. You could put you know ten kids who'd never paddled before. You know, just put a life jacket on them and show them the forward stroke, and one guide who knows what they're doing, and and ideally a person in the front of the canoe too. We call them the first mate. Um, can safely take a, uh, uh, 10 people who'd never had any experience paddling out on the big river, and which some people would say is the most dangerous river. And I would agree with that. Uh, uh, but, uh, and safely take them out and have, a, uh, have a, a camp out or a picnic out on one of the giant beaches and then safely come back to town and, and have an amazing experience that you could not have anywhere else except for some place like the Great Lakes or the St. Lawrence Seaway or Puget Sound or San Francisco Bay or something like that. You know, we're talking world-class waters. Yeah. Right here. You know, so the Voyager Canoe, um, I went back and was able to watch the Mississippi Outdoors television show that Scooter mm-hmm. Watley and others put together a few years ago on a almost a week-long trip down the Mississippi River with you and, and some of your guides. And I remember, you know, mentioning not only the length of those Voyager canoes, almost 30 feet, I guess, but one of the guys made the comment that, yeah, you can put also a giant cooler in the middle of it that'll hold enough provisions for a week, and you still have room for several people to sit, and they travel in this giant canoe. And then at times even almost, you know, use it like a diving board and jump off of it, and it's so stable it wouldn't even tip, Mm -hmm. which... When most people, inexperienced people like myself and others, we hear canoe, we think of that kind of instability can tip it over if you're not real careful. But that's not what – you build some that are really a totally different type of vessel. Yeah, almost. it's a different kind of experience. A Voyager canoe is like a, like a sailboat. Uh, it looks like a sailboat kind of. And we build them with, um, by the, the strip method. Um, 
long strips of wood and, and same method that sailboats and and custom like Chris Craft kind of boats uh-huh. are built and um and they are yeah they're so stable you can stand up you could actually uh walk down the gunnel on one side or the other and it's going to tip a little bit but it won't tip over you know like a small yeah. canoe would do um, but you know, they said the Titanic was unsinkable, you know, and yeah. so it's all about how you do it. Sure. And it's, you know, a person in a 17 foot sea going kayak or a two person, 17 foot, two person canoe, or even a paddleboard. It's all about, uh, the knowledge that you have doing it and you can do it safely in any of those vessels, get on that big river. But the smaller the vessel, the trickier it is, yeah. and the more you got to know. You got, I, in fact, I wouldn't recommend it for uh, anyone uh, uh, ex- except for ex- expert paddlers because it is so tricky and s- mm. so full of surprises. But for expert paddlers, and there are a lot of them out there, it is a paradise. Yeah. So, John, these trips um, – when you, you mentioned this was the genesis of the idea for you and what this has become now 25 years later was taking one person out at a time. Mm-hmm. Now it's groups of people, long trips, um, paddling down the Mississippi River. Describe that for me. Like where does it start and and the size groups that you're taking on these trips and how often mm-hmm. do you do that? Well, we're a custom outfit, so every trip uh, is slightly different. Um but typically, we meet at our home base in Clarksdale. Okay. And we do have a base in Vicksburg, Lane Logue, um, the water possum. He runs our Vicksburg location. And last year, a, uh, uh, Matthew uh, Burdine, um, he opened up a location in Memphis. And um, so typically, we meet at our location. And um, everyone, uh, for overnights, pack your bag. And uh, we provide uh, uh, heavy-duty backpack-style dry bags, sleep bags, tents, mm-hmm. whatever you need. We have it. You could you could show up with your carry-on luggage, and we can take care of it. And um, park your car, um, load up the canoe, which are on twenty-foot farm trailers, and um, uh, head off to the river in one of our vehicles, shuttle. And typically, we go somewhere upstream sometimes to Helena or Tunica Mm. or Memphis or Osceola, Arkansas, on the other side, Carothersville, and get in the big river and uh, head off downstream with the flow. And um, wherever we end up, which would be somewhere downstream, and it could be a day, two days, a week, two weeks, uh, our longest trip is St. Louis to the Gulf of Mexico, and that's six weeks. And we wow. don't do that very often, but it, that is our longest trip. And more typical is Memphis to uh, Greenville or something, or Helena down to Vicksburg, and that's more like a week. And um, uh, wherever we end up, our shuttle driver comes and picks us up, and uh, we return to home base, and you unpack, and and uh, then carry yourself on home. You know, we're completely refreshed and haven't seen the biggest – waters in in the middle of america and um as we go along downstream um, we teach everything no experience necessary no previous experience um just willingness to uh, paddle and and camp out on big uh uh, uh beach size uh, sandbars uh, ocean beach size primitive camping you know similar to to backpacking in uh, in a wild place uh, no facilities, no uh, <clears throat> no uh, conveniences, you know, with everything uh, we need out there. We carry in the canoes, including all the food and water and uh, cookware and uh, emergency supplies. And we go self-contained. And sometimes we go uh, for a week without making a uh, resupply landing, Um it, uh, for longer trips, we resupply along the way. It it obviously sounds like an adventure, an incredible adventure. Do you find that most clients, customers who come and take the trip, that's kind of what they're looking for on the front end? Is they're looking for that adventure? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and we advertise it that way. Yeah. 
as a uh, hands-on uh, paddling adventure where you're going to get sunburnt and mosquito bit and mm -hmm. you're going to get muddy and, and sandy and and camping on sandbars it's uh, not always so comfortable after you know about midnight con uh, uh, sand starts feeling like concrete you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i'm sure but of course we provide pads and and people can bring whatever they want and we'll pack it but um we try to um uh, advertise it, you know, as such as a uh, primitive style camping uh, adventure um, in a, a, a wild place. Even though they're tow boats and passing fishing boats, it's still a wild landscape, as wild as any as I've ever experienced. Mm. And I'm from uh, 8,500 feet in the front range of the Rocky Mountains. I grew up on the edge of Arapaho National Forest. And as a kid, that was my back you know, my, my backyard, but I feel, uh, uh, that, uh, feeling of wildness, uh, is strongly or maybe stronger because the river is such a powerful, uh, untamable, uh, spirit, you know, um, full of vitality and life and color and always changing, but, uh, uh so very, uh, inspirational, but at times frightening also. Sure. Uh, and um, the being on the big river, you're not like if you go the Buffalo River or the Strong River or, you know, the, the, the Wolf River of Mississippi, you're usually protected by the woods on either side and, and you're in a place that uh, winds and, and uh, uh, strong storms, you know, you don't have to worry too much. You're going to get wet in the storm, of course, but... Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about the wind, but out in the Mississippi, it's more like paddling in the Mississippi Sound, you know, out to the barrier islands like Horn Island, because you are exposed and, and wide open to the elements. Yeah. So it's a it's a river trip, but it feels like uh, you're almost on an ocean. <laughs> yeah. You have a lot of return customers. A lot of return customers. Yeah. The the uh, we call them the Tupelo Quapas, uh, uh, Greg Burks and Lynn Bryant and. Shout out to you guys. Uh, they come every year with a group uh, group of guys. They're a group of uh, nurses and former nurses that come from Jackson every year. Shout out to Linda Brewer. They've been doing that for 20 years and the Tupelo guys for about 10 years. And we've been serving uh, Jackson Academy. They do an annual, uh, was originally fifth grade trip. We've been doing it for 10 years. We now have kids that are graduating and going on to college who come back and, and remember that Mississippi River trip they took as a fifth grader, and now sixth grade. It's their annual sixth grade uh, adventure. That is cool. And the entire sixth grade comes, uh, those who aren't other sports or something, I mean, who don't have sports obligation. Uh, and we do it in a boys' uh, camp, a three-day trip uh, for the boys, and then the week after that we do a three-day trip for the girls. Or vice versa. Yeah, really cool. I'm I'm relaying a question to you that Chip. We were we were talking a little bit before you got here to the studio, mm -hmm. and Chip said, you know, one question I really want to ask John is just regarding all of this, the river, the trips down the river, doing it in a canoe. Why? Just just why? And I know you touched on a little bit earlier the the purpose and the adventure, but mm -hmm. if someone just walked up to you, John, and said, "Hey, why why do you do this?" Yeah, how well, would you answer that? Well, for, uh, the easy answer is because it's there, because it's the biggest river in North America, and and it's it's the Mississippi River that that Mark Twain wrote about, and and uh, Langston Hughes uh, uh, wrote poetry about, and and uh, and paintings have been made, and songs sung, John Hartford, and uh, Credence Clearwater Revival, and uh, and the band, and I mean the Mississippi is like uh, part of our national identity and our and our heritage. And uh, I mean, especially for Americans, it's like part of who we are. All of us, doesn't even matter if you live in the Mississippi Valley or not, it's part of you somewhere. Mm -hmm. And um, and then the other thing is um, uh, the wilderness value, you know, the thing that uh, Thoreau uh, uh, wrote about and Muir made national parks uh, out of this feeling that human beings need that kind of rejuvenation, uh, spiritual, uh, physical, mental rejuvenation that can only come 
from uh, uh, experience in a wild place. And, uh, you know, quote unquote wild, that could mm -hmm. be uh, right here in the Pearl River, you know, going over Lafleur's Bluff. Yeah. Or it could be uh, going out to one of the horn, uh, one of the barrier islands or, or you don't have to go far to find that experience. Mm -hmm. But the Mississippi is full of it. All you have to do is go over the levee and get on the water, and it is totally wild and immediately uh, captivating and um, sometimes uh, puzzling. You know, it's hard, sometimes it's, uh, especially for first-time paddlers, uh, to kind of understand what's going on and what is the scale of this giant body of water that you're on. Sometimes it feels like you're not moving, but then... 15 minutes later, you look back and the landing that you started out is miles away, you know, yeah. so it's yeah. a, it's a very active river. <laughs> yeah, sure. We call her the queen and uh, I feel like I'm a worker bee because everything I do is somehow connected to uh, serving the river and creating more opportunity for our clients and at the same time, it's very rewarding for myself personally and, um, and helps sustain, uh, it sustain me and my family and uh, I have a 16-year-old daughter at the Mississippi School of Arts in Brookhaven, and she's studying dance, and, and uh, it, it's helped sustain me and my family and our guides. We have like 12 guides and about six uh, shuttle drivers, and um, it is a uh, it, uh, outdoor recreation is an important uh, aspect or can be of any economy. Because the people that come to do trips on rivers or, or, or fishing or hunting or mountain bikes or whatever, they stay in the hotels, they eat the food, they, mm -hmm. they, they uh, bring a, a lot of valuable uh, greenbacks to any local economy. So um, uh, I just mentioned that because that's all part of the reason why I do it and keep doing it. You know, it, there's, it's like a very multi-layered uh, wholesome, uh, good thing. I feel like. Sure. It's so a week long canoe trip, uh, for a group mm -hmm. down the river. How do you have enough food for a week? How do you guys take care of that? Well, we just pack it in those big canoes. They're, they're made for originally they were made to carry, uh, uh, beaver pelts, you know, like, okay. Like thousands of pounds of beaver pelts from the interior of Canada out the St. Lawrence sea Seaway to uh, Quebec, where they'd be shipped across the ocean, you know, during the, the beaver craze, the, be the, 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 the fur hat craze, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And so they're, the canoes um, can handle a, a big volume. And, um, but uh, over the years, over the decades, um, we have come up with recipes that, you know, work again and again. We bring basic raw ingredients, uh, meats, cheeses, eggs, uh, fruits and veggies and beans and rice and pasta and uh, basic things and, uh, and cook them while we're out there. Uh, we don't carry freeze-dried things. We, we don't go lightweight. We don't, you don't have to in a canoe. You know, when you're backpacking in the Grand Canyon, you got. Sure. You got to carry everything on your back, but on the uh, on a river, the canoe does carries it for you. You know that's really cool. And uh, we carry all the water we need if we happen to run out of water in the summertime. Especially we boil water, okay, and um, let it settle out first, and uh, boil it, and use it for coffee, tea, and um, cooking. Yeah, it's fascinating. You know, the, I think about the historical aspect of the river too, which it's pretty obvious, you know, but really any part, any era of American history, it's a major part of it. And, and, and the obvious things that, you know, the, the Lewis and Clark, you know, expeditions, you think about the importance mm -hmm. of the river and, and where it started and what the goal was. You think about Civil War history and what it means to Mississippi. You know, my wife's from Vicksburg. I became interested, began to study. Well, there's, you know, at the crux of the American Civil War, there's Abraham Lincoln saying, you know, Vicksburg is the key and until it's in my pocket. And that had everything to do with the river. It's, it's really at the center, you know, literally and figuratively of everything every chapter in every history book in our country, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It sure is. Yeah. The, uh, 
Abraham Lincoln went down to New Orleans and uh, was, you know, uh, uh, struck by what was happening, you know, in Congo Square, for instance, and, you know, later mm-hmm. led to decisions he made. And, and uh, but it's also been so inspirational for poets. Walt Whitman was mm-hmm. uh, uh, likewise was very inspired by New Orleans and and uh, painters and uh, musicians and photographers and uh, writers. Uh, I mean, it's like a constant source of of uh, life, culture, economy. It's everything. Yeah, you know, and that's what. Uh, and the wind and the willows. You know that book. Uh, you know, the river was everything. It right. Uh, what is the river? Well, it's everything. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so the, you were at the Delta Blues Museum, the curator mm. there for those years. Mm. And Charlie Pride is one of my favorites, one of those I've looked up to. One, because he was a baseball player before he became a musician. Mm. A lot of people didn't know that. And he's from Mississippi. But he, I think, wrote and sang that song, Roll On Mississippi. <gasps> and it's obviously about the river. Years later, uh, there was a, a cover of that song by Neil McCoy and Trace Adkins, which is a great version of the song. Music, that's the other thing, too. I mean, you, you touched on it earlier, but, I mean, just go turn the radio on today, 2024. S- hit seek, chances are you're going to hear somebody singing about the river. Mm-hmm. And so there's another example of what it means and what it has meant. That's right. You know, Mississippi man, Louisiana woman, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. And what's the dividing line? It's obviously that river. Um, okay, you mentioned your longest trip. You went all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Mm. Is is that with a group of people you, you took on that uh-huh. journey? And yeah. it took six weeks. Six weeks, yeah. Um, river time always depends on water level. Um, mm-hmm. But six weeks approximately, uh, we've done that. Couple of times, one time with a German uh, a film crew that wanted to document the, that entire stretch of river, and um, they made a uh, film production that appeared on uh, public television uh, uh, in Germany. ARD. Uh, then they called it Mister and Mississippi. It was led okay. by these two uh, uh, public figures, a, a poet and a, a TV uh, anchor woman named Patricia Schaefer. And uh, they made this uh, uh, thing out of that. But we've since done it uh, many times. And the last time we did it full length was before pandemic, uh, 2017. Um, it's part of a, 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 a celebration of a, of a river guide that we published. and is now available online. And I'm going to put it into book print, uh, hopefully in the next year or two. It's called River Gator. It's one word, and you can go to it, rivergator.org, and it describes mile by mile the Mississippi River uh, for paddlers uh, from St. Louis to the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, we took a group of, uh, of uh, uh, it was two to three canoes um, uh, 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 all the way from St. Louis to the Gulf of Mexico in celebration of that. That's fantastic. So kind of back to my earlier question, and I know you answered it. It may be repetitive, but I'm just fascinated with canoes from St. Louis to the Gulf of Mexico and six weeks worth of supplies and food that way. Do you ever mm. procure food naturally along a trip like that? Uh-huh. Yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're uh, uh, what would you say, hunter-gatherers? Yeah, you know, sure. We don't, we don't go shoot things, but uh-huh. uh, we do fish. Uh, Mark River Peoples, he's my chief guide. And he's also a fisherman, and um, but we gather uh, fruits, you know, bear, uh, when the mulberries or the uh, uh, dewberries are mm-hmm. in season, uh, we add those to every meal uh, we can. And um, there's some uh, there's some greens that we sometimes harvest, uh, 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 like stinging nettle. Um, mm-hmm which if you boil makes a really delicious green. There's another one called Curly Dock, which uh, grows on all the islands. Uh, beyond that, we don't do a lot. Yeah. But uh, we, what we do do is uh, once a week uh, on those longer expeditions, we do go into town and resupply yeah, you know, sure. with everything we need. Very cool. And water. We carry five-gallon water jugs, you know. And, yeah. And, um, 
So, so your familiarity with that, you know, the plant life and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. How does a guy from Colorado as a young guy learn that? Well, <laughs> some of it has been trial and error, you know. Yeah. Uh, what tastes good, uh, you know, is good, and be ready to spit it out after the first chew, you know. Yeah. But uh, I've read a lot of books, and uh, but mostly what I've learned is from other people, naturalists that we've had on trips, biologists, and um, the berries are easy, you know, they're obvious, but it gets tricky with the greens. Oh, yeah, and the fungi, you better watch out what you're doing, you know. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, there are little tricks to it, and a survivalist who spent two years in the Chafalaya River Basin, uh, he taught me, and I haven't heard otherwise, um, that any fungi grown on willow is edible. And um, now, uh, kids, uh, you know, consult your fungi book before uh, doing that, but... Uh, yeah. Um, mostly what we see in this stretch of river is the oyster mushroom and it, it loves wella trees, downed wella especially. Hmm. And, um, that it makes a delicious addition to a pasta or, uh, you know, something like that. Yeah. But, uh, uh, fish and, um, amphibians and stuff like that. You know, if you had the time, you could really, uh, you could survive out there. It, it's a garden of Eden. Hmm. Um, but typically, we don't have a, uh, a lot of extra time to, uh, you know, go hunting and gathering. And <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> Our um, trips are more about exploration and uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for each person to have uh, individual time, you know, uh, walking or paddling or swimming or, you know, whatever it is you want to do out there. Yeah. Rock handing is a big one and bird watching also. Sure. For someone listening that the light bulb's gone off and they think, you know, he mentioned this adventure and sort of, uh, I, I need that replenishment. I need to go through that. I need to look into it. Mm-hmm. How do they get in touch with you? Well, it's easy. Go to our website, island63.com. And that's named after the big island close to Clarksdale, Island 63. Okay. It was also the year I was born. Uh, and, um, uh, you'll find air, all the information there, uh, describing trips, uh, how to make a booking, you know, how to contact us. Um, it's real easy. Just pick out a date and uh, and uh, 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 the number of people you want to go, and and uh, and we'll put it together. It um, and maybe you have a particular section of river you want to see. We can do that. Typically, though, people want to come to Clarksdale and, and maybe enjoy a night of music and then get on the river and then come back to town and enjoy another night of music. And you know, it makes a, a, a good, wholesome trip that way. Sure. Speaking of music, next time you come here, you'll have to bring your guitar. I'll bring my guitar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I look it's, forward to that. It's a river guitar. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we, we uh, the river has a way. It's like a mother of invention. Uh you, uh, we, we've come up with recipes and sayings and, uh, and, and songs also. So I actually have a number of original songs that have come out of the experience. That's and right. also one thing I forgot to mention, Leon Pattenberg. Do you, do you know him? Not familiar. He's a Jackson-based uh, survival teacher. Okay. And he wrote a book about um, survival training and methods and published it, and um, now he splits his time between here and Oregon. But um, he's partners with us sometimes and does Mississippi River survival training. Wow. And someone who wants to learn more about that can hire. We do the guiding and outfitting, and Leon is the teacher for it. Um, And he actually paddled the length of the Mississippi like I did uh, back in the 80s. Uh, but he did it in a canoe. I was on a raft. You you went the length of the Mississippi River on a raft? On, on a raft, a 12 by 24 foot raft that my best friend and I from high school built. And we actually didn't make it. We uh, we uh, ended in disaster. And uh, uh, but that's another story. But uh, my first night in the state of Mississippi, our wreck was just south of Memphis in February of 1983. And... Um, <laughs> My first night in the state of Mississippi was actually on a big island, the first big island coming out of Tennessee into Mississippi above Tunica. 
it's near uh, DeSoto, um, is Cat Island. And that was my first uh, experience in Mississippi. So that was when the accident happened or the, uh -huh. and the raft was gone. I have to ask you what happened. I got to know more. Well, we, uh, <laughs> we uh, wrecked it on a, um, a TVA power line tower that was planted right in the middle of the river. They don't do this anymore. They never put uh, mm -hmm. industrial scale stuff like that in the middle of the river. Buoys, that's the only thing you'll see in the middle of the river today. Yeah. But for some reason, it must have been an artifact of the past, TVA ran a line, and there's a power plant in South Memphis on McKellar Lake, which is their industrial harbor. And the power line uh, went over a, a tower that sat right in the middle of the river. And in 1983, we did not pay attention. We did not think in a mile-wide river that we were going to end up mm -hmm. anywhere near one thing, you know, like that. We did. Mm -hmm. And it wrecked us completely. And so you spent... Your first night in Mississippi on Cat Island. Cat Island, uh, a muddy refugee, uh, <laughs> shivering around a, a fire. Luckily, we were able to get a fire going. And yeah. That was 1983. We started in August of 1982 up in uh, um, uh, uh, Minnesota. Okay. Uh, uh, wow. Built a raft and started downstream, and it took us that many months to uh, get down to there. We took a month off for Christmas. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. So, uh, you sh that sounds like a book. <laughs> it ought to be. Um, and and uh, you mentioned Cat Island. Again, I went back. I watched the Mississippi Outdoors television show from a couple of years ago where Scooter Watley went down the river with you. And I think I remember in that video, you and the, the group, y'all camped on Cat Island. That was a different Cat Island. That was, was it a, different? Okay. That was a Cat Island of the Arkansas River. Okay. We were down in the Arkansas River confluence and there. The, uh, the big island right there at the mouth is Cat Island. Okay. So the, the Cat Island that, that we uh, uh, were rescued on was uh, the Cat Island of the Mississippi. Okay. Two different ones. Yeah. That's another thing, you know, the names, the names of islands, the names of, like you say, confluences of river and points on the river. Mm -hmm. um, names are really interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also, uh, that's another thing I've noticed is, there's a lot of nicknames. Your crew, your your um, guides, uh, everybody's got a nickname too. Yeah. Is that yeah, a river thing? There, it's a river thing, definitely. I mean, the musicians do it too, and you know, hobos and yeah. uh, river rats. Yeah, we uh, truck drivers. You know, uh, you have you have your handles, but uh, uh, yeah, the river does something to you. It, mm. it uh, causes your imagination to do flip flops, and uh, you come up with with uh, a, a lot of uh, funny and unusual things. And, yeah. But things that stand the test of time. You know, Mark Twain, he took his name for Samuel Clemens. That was the uh, uh, a way of uh, gauging the depth of the river. And Mark Twain was uh, 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 the uh, indication of the depth of the river. So I'm known as Driftwood Johnny. Driftwood Johnny. Who uh, gave you that nickname? Uh, a uh, carpenter in Clarksdale uh, who uh, used to <laughs> holler out every time he see me, Hey, Driftwood! <laughs> Just holler down the street as loud That's as he good. could, and it, I don't know, it stuck. Yeah. And I kind of floated down here like a piece of Driftwood back in the 80s and never left. And uh, hmm. Mark River, uh, uh, River is his uh, uh, nickname, and it, it it's very appropriate. He's kind of like Mark Twain. He writes uh, about the river. And... Um, uh, Heather Cross, she's uh, she's also known as the Red River Otter. She's from the Red River Valley of Louisiana. Yeah. And uh, she's kind of like an otter, she's very playful. Uh, another guy, uh, Whit Smith, uh, we call him Tumbleweeds. Yeah. And uh, uh, JP, he's also Dragline. And uh, Lane Logue over in uh, uh, Vicksburg, he runs our Vicksburg operation. He's water possum. Yeah, I heard you mention water possum earlier. Mm -hmm. That's great. And Mississippi, uh, 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 Matthew uh, Burdine, he used to be known as Mississippi. He was a, 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 he used to guide rafts on the Arkansas River in the central Colorado Rockies near uh, Buena Vista. And, um, but he's from Greenville, the son of uh, Hank Burdine, uh, 
uh, who, who uh, uh, may God rest his soul, passed uh, away, a, a Mississippi legend, an author, and great outdoorsman himself. And his son, Matthew, uh, started our location up in Memphis, and, and uh, sometimes he's known as the Mississippi Merman. How about that? <laughs> I get it. So the Quapaw Canoe Company and Island 63. Island63.com, yes, sir. That's great. I would think, John, that there aren't many people, really maybe ever, but certainly now in 2024, who if you ask them, how did you wind up in Mississippi, are going to answer truthfully, well, I wrecked my raft near Cat Island, <laughs> and I've been here ever since. Not many people would say that, but you can. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, and it's a good reason to be here, and uh, and and somehow the mud got stuck between my toes, and I have not been able to kick it off, uh, even this many years later. I've been here longer in Mississippi than not. Well, we're glad you're here. Oh, thanks for the discussion, and yeah. uh, look forward to, to more river time sometime. Yeah, I look forward to getting to talk to you again, too, on uh, the Mississippi Outdoors podcast. Thank you. Okay, thank you. It's John Rusky here on the Mississippi Outdoors podcast. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you outdoors.